Welcome back, everyone. I'm Sarah Peck, and this is the Startup Pregnant Podcast. Okay, today we have a jam-packed episode to talk all about the logistics of hiring a nanny. Childcare is something that can feel really overwhelming, and figuring it out, especially when you're postpartum and you have so many other things going on, plus you're trying to rest and heal, oh, it can be really, really hard. With my first kid, we searched for a local daycare. It was an in-home daycare, and we found one that we liked, luckily, when our kid was about four months old, and we started there. We also had family help. Starting around six weeks old, my sister came to town for a month to help out. She's a high school teacher, so she had summer vacation. And then my in-laws came and visited for several weeks as well. With my second kid and having a little more space to think through, okay, we've been through the daycare scene. We know what that's like, been there, done that. What would I choose for a second kid? I struggled a little bit because I thought to myself, you know, I would really love to try a nanny, but is that insane to have one kid in daycare and then have a nanny over here? Like, What am I doing? And also, I'd never done it before. So I didn't know if it would be the right call, but I ended up, crazy as I am, wanting to try it. So I reached out to my friend and an amazing business boss lady. Her name is Anna Franzen. And I asked her for her tips and her advice. She had previously reached out to a dozen or so business owners, female business owners, and put together this whole workflow of best practices for hiring a nanny and tips for onboarding. And she had this system and this process that she was using in her own home. And so I reached out and I said, how'd you do it? What did you do? What were the workflow steps? And I got the download from her. And basically, while doing that, I realized that we needed to record a podcast episode so that if you, dear listener, are thinking about hiring a nanny, then you can download our brains and workflows and not have to start from scratch. Honestly, one of the things that I want to do here at Startup Pregnant and so much of what I'm doing is trying to build ways to make it easier to be a parent and an entrepreneur so that we are not each all individually reinventing the wheel and wasting time reinventing processes and just using each other's brains so that we can get back to whatever is our calling and our interest, whether it's spending more time with our children or writing or working more on our businesses, but doing the interesting work that matters to us and not the work that's like, and now how do I hire a nanny? So if you want, I'm making a checklist to go along with this episode and you can get it at startuppregnant.com slash nanny checklist. It's going to be a checklist of everything that we talk about today and a workflow for how to think about hiring a nanny. That'll be at startuppregnant.com slash nanny checklist. The link is in the show notes as well. I hope you really enjoyed this episode. I do hope it's useful to all of you and a huge thanks to Anna Franzen who runs the Heart Centered Entrepreneur for all of her hiring and workflow wisdom and for joining me on today's episode. Welcome to the Startup Pregnant Podcast, where we talk to creative leaders about what it means to be an entrepreneur and a parent. I'm your host, Sarah K. Peck. We have just kicked off the mastermind, our Wise Women's Council for the year 2019. If you or someone you know is looking for a community space to join with other wise women and commune together over the course of almost a year, Come check out the Wise Women's Council at startuppregnant.com slash WWC, or go to our website at startuppregnant.com and look for the button that says Wise Women's Council. We are kicking it off this week, but if you need to join and you are getting this message now, I trust you. You know you, you know what you need, and I hope that this message lands for you at the right time. I am keeping a few extra spaces open for those who need it. So if you hear this at any point during March and you say to yourself, I've been looking for a mastermind, I need a community of women and doing this alone is not working, then come check it out and fill out an application. I will leave the applications open through the rest of March just for anybody who needs it. I will be reviewing them on a rolling basis. And if you need to join, just let us know. All right, everyone, let's get back to today's episode. Hey 
Hey everyone, I am so excited for today's episode. In today's show, we are going to talk all about how to hire a nanny. This is a special episode with a guest co-host and a friend of mine, Anna Franzen. Anna, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I am so glad you're here. I know we have a lot to talk about. (laughs) I cannot wait to dive in. Um, So for those of you who don't know, Anna is a business coach and she's a mentor. She's the founder and the CEO of the Heart Centered Entrepreneur. She works with people on building great systems, getting visibility, attracting clients. She has this awesome strategy called getting uh, taking a CEO day and so much more. Um, But today's show, I haven't actually interviewed her for the podcast. I'll put a little asterisk in there yet. I want to interview her. But for today's show, we are going to talk all about hiring childcare help, specifically a nanny. So this isn't my typical interview podcast. It's a, it's just a special show dedicated to one single topic. And I'm so glad Anna is here because she is like a systems genius. And we're constantly going back and forth and trading tips about hiring best practices and resources for being a female founder and a business owner and so much more. So Anna... To set the context, I would like for both of us, for everybody listening, to describe our childcare setups. Can you tell me, you're in California, tell me about your kids, how old they are, and what, quote, going back to work looked like for you? Oh, my land. So I feel like I'm so glad we're having this conversation because it's one I wish I had two years ago, one year ago. And we've had so many childcare arrangements in the past two years. Like I can't even like probably like seven different arrangements just because kids change, nap schedules change, our son started preschool, you know, I have my own mental stuff around being a working mom versus a stay at home mom. And so I feel like it's looked a million different ways. <laughs> mm-hmm. Amen. I'm shocked because because my kids are uh, two and a, two years, eight months, and four months old at the time in this recording. So I think our kids are similar. Yours are a little older. Yeah, two and four. Two and four, right? So you're you've been doing this a little longer, and it is shocking to me that I thought it was you know figure out childcare once the child is born, and then you kind of yes. have it for the rest of your life. And it's not like that at all. It's like no. every six months it has to be refigured out. Yes. So when I was still doing, I quit my first corporate job to do therapy because I had my master's in counseling. And so when I first had my son, I was working part-time three days a week. And so when I started my business and merged to that, I kept that three-day-a-week working schedule because my husband also worked three days a week. So at that point, we didn't have any child care. And so for the first little chapter of my business, I was doing, we were both just working three days. So that's how we started. Wow. How did you end up deciding to do that as an option? Such a good question. I think, well, I knew that I didn't want to work full-time hours anymore. And so I don't know how we decided. I think it just made sense, right? I work three days, you work three days, and whoever is not working is with the, with our son. Right. Did that work? It worked so well. Well, also my therapy hours were very flexible. And yeah, somehow it just worked really well with one. I feel like when we had our second, first, it just started getting a little more complicated because even though oh, I don't even, why did it feel more complicated? I think we were just dealing with two schedules. We had a newborn again. And so at that point, I felt like something needed to shift. And that's when I quit my therapy job, went all in on the coaching. And at some point, I'm trying to remember what our first thing was. <laughs> it's at hard to some, remember. <laughs> <laughs> at some point, we decided we wanted to hire a nanny. But I think I was still, oh, we just did preschool. That was what we did first. We just did preschool. Right. Because the older one probably turned two-ish, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Or when he was turning three, we did we did preschool. The problem with preschool, it's wonderful and educational, and we actually are in love with this preschool, but it doesn't really do a lot of relief for childcare because it's three hours. So it's basically drop-offs and pickups and that whole thing. Right. It's like nine to twelve. A lot of preschools are nine to twelve. And then but then you have to like get the child out the door and then to the school. And then you have to get yourself to a place. And then you have like an hour of time, if anything. Yeah. It's so complicated. And I of course two is more complicated because they're not napping at the same time. So there's one of them that's always awake. Because I knew this about my second child. I was like, oh, I'm going to have some time to be able to work when they nap, but it can't be on-demand work or uh, live work. I can't take calls because I never know when they're going to nap, but it can be writing work. So it's it's really interesting to notice how even my thinking about childcare has changed over the past couple of years. 
it's also, I mean, for those of you who have tuned into this episode, How to Hire a Nanny, I imagine that you have clicked in because you're like, oh my gosh, why is this so complicated? Because everywhere there are so many different rules. Like some daycare centers don't take infants and some do, but some only start at age two or age three. And then some of them are only half day programs or they're school programs, but they're not open in the summertime. So you still need to get childcare coverage for July and August because contrary to everyone's wishes, we don't all stop working in July and August. So it is just a cluster mess out there. Okay, so you have two kids, they're two and four. And sometime in the last year, you decided to get a nanny. Why a nanny? Yes. Well, I'm happy to share that too, but I'm curious. I want to know your pre nanny <laughs> okay, story. Like, sure. do you have a pre nanny history? Yeah, we have a, a big one, and it's actually like I'm in the middle of it. So it feels very fresh because my second child was just born four months ago, which is so weird to say. It's like it was yesterday, and then also like it's been two years, and I don't really understand how to conceptualize that, but I just keep waking up every day and sometimes <laughs> at night. <laughs> like, uh, uh, oftentimes at night. <laughs> literally. Um, <laughs> literally. So. When our first child was born, I'm only now starting to realize how much was going on, but I was working on a startup and starting my own company on the side. I just finished maternity leave. My husband had just gotten a big new job. Our baby was born. We moved from Brooklyn to Manhattan, which like is was no we were searching for housing when our first child was 3 months old. And we found a place and then I needed to find a daycare, which I hadn't figured out yet because Well, there was a lot going on. And then I had all of the people, every time I would ask somebody about finding a daycare, they're like, you don't have a daycare yet? I figured that out when I was two months pregnant. And I was like, I didn't even know I was pregnant. Like, (laughs) it was just, it was just like, there was so much kind of, what is it called? Like type A shaming? Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) when you're like, oh, you haven't done this yet? And I was like- You should have been on top of this Yeah, that, that. And apparently there are wait lists for daycares in New York City and many other places that are like up to a year long. So- I just couldn't even put that in my head. I was like, we just have to find one. And we did. We found one in our neighborhood. It was a local in-home daycare. It was so great. We live in a neighborhood that is actually about 70, 75% Dominican. So there's amazing restaurants and amazing Dominican food. And they had this amazing cook who cooked all these rice and beans. I I don't know. I just loved it. And our Leo went from nine to five, full-time daycare starting at four months old because I was still technically working at my job and I was starting a startup. Beautiful. You dove right in. How? What was that like? Like, what was that like going like at four months, full-time daycare, go like diving right back to work at four months? Like, how was that? It was too much for me. I loved what I did and I wanted to do it. So the amount of time I got to spend on my work was really, really pleasurable. I like loved having the time to myself, but around, I don't know if you can hear that. You're going to, my kid's actually crying in the background because the nanny's here. So we'll get to that later. Okay. Okay. (laughs) For people listening, I can hear it, (laughs) which is a new experience. So around four o'clock every day, I really wanted to see my baby. I like really wanted to. And I ended up having to talk to my husband and just say, I need to, even though we're paying for full-time childcare, I need to be able to go and pick him up early on the days when I just want to spend more time with them. But at the same time, I felt really grateful that my child was being brought up with like an army full of capable, competent, wonderful adults. And he was being held all day and loved on and like was socialized. But I also saw how much he slept. And I was like, well, this kid sleeps a lot. He sleeps a lot during the day. So I don't need to like cart him across the city or across the neighborhood just to go sleep over there. I wonder if I could do it differently. But I didn't have the bandwidth then to um, make changes. And I knew that consciously. I knew that like trying to find a new solution wouldn't work. But that's why this time it was different because I had Henry, my my younger son, and I was like, you know, I want him closer. I want him closer and I want a nanny. I'm going to do it this time. I didn't do it last time, so I'm going to try it yeah. this time. Man, I, I totally feel you on that. I feel like there's so much insight that we get the first time. Like, I feel like looking back, like, I feel like I survived it, but I feel like I wish I would have gotten more support earlier because it was a lot. Like, it it was a lot and it didn't feel... But it felt like I had, it didn't feel like there was another option. Like I felt like, or even, so before I did the therapy, I was overseeing a residence life program 
at a university. And so I could kind of like, I would baby wear my son. Like I got to do a lot with him because I worked a lot with the students and my sister would watch him some for me. But like, I, like looking back, I wish I would have given myself more permission to get more support earlier. I agree. And I also, I also feel like I want to offer myself and anyone listening, like a lot of forgiveness because we are all doing the best we can. It is not clear how to do it. And it, in retrospect, it's easy for, for me to say, oh, I wish I had researched all the options and figured it all out. And I'm an obsessive researcher. So for me not to have time to research is saying a lot, like just for context. It's sometimes you just do the best you can and 70, 80% is beyond good enough. And I don't hold a place of regret. I think regret's too strong of a word. It's more like, oh, I didn't know that I would want my baby around more. And now I have that knowledge and that's cool. And I can use that to inform future decisions about how much I work over the summer if I want to spend time with my kids and things like that. Yes. Oh, that's so good. And I feel like for me, it's almost the same, but opposite, right? Like I almost feel like I could have been around my baby a little less and and still have been, we both have, would have been okay. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's so fun. That's so good to hear, right? Like it's like we're both, it's like, okay, there's not a perfect thing. You just have to kind of listen and say, what is it that I'm wanting more of? Okay. So for people who want to get childcare help, which I think is everyone because because frankly, like, I'm going to insert my opinion here, because this is a special episode, but I don't think a woman or a parent should be alone with a child for more than like, four to six hours at a time, anyone ever. Like, I think you need breaks, I think you need help. Like we have employment laws for a reason, we should kind of apply them to parenting as well. And yet I see so many, so many parents in today's day and age, partly because of our lack of social structures, social infrastructure and help. They go so long thinking that they have to take care of their child always and it's only them. And and so if you are considering help, first of all, if I were a good audio editor, I would insert like lots of cheers like, yay, good for you. <laughs> yay, <woo-hoo. laughs> yay. But second, then how the heck do you do it? Like how do you find it and, and how do you look? And it's a huge puzzle and hopefully and I talking through what we did can help you do it and make it feel less overwhelming and more practical and more like, okay, first we talk about like, do I want a nanny or childcare? Second, we talk about how do you do the search process? Third, we'll talk about how do you hire? Like what's good hiring practice? And then we'll get into some of the nuts and bolts of like being an employer, which both Anna and I have done onboarding. Yeah. So let's start at the beginning, which is searching. I think I said searching. (laughs) Yeah. And I feel like at least for me, there was even a step before that and it was deciding. And I feel like not all women may be in this position, but I feel like I was in a place of still really struggling with a lot of mom guilt for even though I was a working mom, I've always been a working mom. I think I like somewhat brainwashed myself to think like, but I'm not really a working mom because I'm around all my kids. Like hiring a nanny for me was fully owning. I'm a working mom. And I'm still a good mom. And so before I dove in, I feel like I had to decide. And that was like, I want a nanny and I want a nanny for this many hours. And ideally, I would like them to work these days and these hours. That was extremely hard for me. You just gave me chills because (laughs) it's so true. It's deciding. And I think the unspoken thing there is the idea of I have to do it all myself, right? Like, And there's this impossible scenario that we put women in particular into, which is in order to be a good working mom, you have to be 100% mom and 100% working. And it's not possible, right? Like To record this podcast right now, I have to have someone else watching my baby in the other room. I have only ever recorded one podcast episode with my baby right next to me while I'm bouncing him. And it was so hard. <laughs> it was so I was hard like, that's so brave. <laughs> that is so brave. <laughs> well, it was an episode about being postpartum. And so it made sense. I was like, okay, everyone, the baby's right here. But yeah, it's, I love what you just said. So for people deciding that they want and need childcare help, what do you think goes into that decision? 
Oh, my lands. Well, I, I'm really fortunate that my husband has been really supportive this whole time. And, you know, he was supportive either way. Like, if you want to stay home, if you want to work, I think it's realizing that you need to be decisive, but also you're not locked in, right? Like, yes, you need to get really clear for the hiring process on what you want, who you want, what you want them to do, but you can always change your mind, right? So knowing that if something doesn't work out, if a schedule doesn't work out, or I love that example you gave with the daycare, even if you're paying for more hours, still, like, what's that principle where not sunk cost? Is it sunk cost principle? I think so. Yeah. Like be able to still take the control and charge of what you really want along the way. Mm-hmm. So I don't mm-hmm. know if the answer to the question. Yeah. No, I, I think what's really good here, part of the art of deciding is knowing what you want. So it's about clarity and figuring out what is it that you want and what would be most useful to you. And I will add in and voice out loud that hiring any form of childcare is expensive. So if people are listening and they're like, well, that's easy, I would just get 50 hours because it'd be this much, but it would be that much money and I don't have that money. This actually still applies. So for example, you could be working only during your child's nap times. And what you want, let's say, you could say, I want an hour to myself every day uninterrupted. Who can you ask for that help from? Is there a mom or a dad or a aunt or an uncle or a partner or somebody in your life where you can say, hey, I'm struggling to get my business off the ground and I really need five hours a week. Is there any way you could come over for the hour before dinner time? And there's different ways to do this that don't have to be about full-time childcare, many thousands of dollars. It comes down to deciding like what would be most helpful to you and what do you want? A hundred percent. Because I feel like to the people in our life, I mean, when we're decisive, when we take time on our own as women to get clear on what we want, then I feel like at least for me, my partner follows suit. My, I'm of course like he's going to disagree if he needs to, but like the, my inner confidence shines through and I feel like the right support steps up when I first inside resolve my own stuff and get clear on what I want. A thousand percent. And you know, this reminds me of a conversation I had with someone where She had uh, morning childcare or morning daycare, the nine to 12 model. And she was so miserable because she really wanted to work more. But the hardest part for her was recognizing and honoring the part of her that wanted to work more. And once she was like, you know what? I want to work more than 12 hours a week. I really want to work 20 to 25 hours a week. I need 10 more hours of childcare. And if I get it, I will probably make more money in my business because of it. Like that's the change moment is deciding. So I love that you brought this up. And because otherwise, if you don't do this step, you're going to sabotage the process. And if you find that you've been stuck in this process for a long time or it's not working, I would seriously look at maybe I'm self-sabotaging because what I'm trying to get is not actually what I want. Ooh, Anna. Like... (laughs) I only am saying this because I've done it so many (laughs) freaking times, right? Like, so if you're saying, oh, this is so hard or it's never working, like it's probably because you're not clear, really, really clear on what you're truly wanting. Right. Maybe it's that you don't want full-time childcare. You want- A hundred percent. Six months to stay at home with your kid or you want- that's so good. Ooh. Okay, now we can move to the nitty gritty. Sorry. Okay. Just no, this, like fine. that was like for me, even though all of this hiring stuff is hard, the hardest part was getting to this now where we're at. Yes. You know, I that's so true because I struggled with a lot of guilt around switching. We had a place in a daycare set up for Henry before Henry was born. And we picked out my older son's childcare because they also have an infant program. So according to everybody, like we were on the track and the track was taking both children. Yeah, exactly. And it ended up being really, I remember being like, I don't want that. I want to be home with my kid. I want him home with me. Because I just knew that it would be so inefficient. I'd be taking him to childcare and then I'd be like, traveling home to pump, but I could just put my boob in his face and it would only be six months. And also, this is my last baby. Like we're not planning on having more children. And I like babies. I know not everyone loves all of the stages of different development. I know several friends are like, no, I'm definitely firmly a school age mom. That's my sweet spot. Like babies are okay, but I'm not as in love with them as like my three year old, five year old, seven year old. I love babies. Like I love babies. And so taking them 40 blocks away from where I live and having someone else take care of him. It made sense for the first one. And Leo's doing so great. But I knew I wanted something different. 
Yes. For me, it was total. I love what you said at the start too, about the efficiency. And like, I want to be my kids to be away from me for as little time as possible. And so like, it felt the most efficient to have someone like w- without the transportation and without all that. And for us too, a big deciding factor was our son is like his little three hour day preschool. He just thrives in like, it's been such a beautiful thing for him. And so I didn't want to pull him out of preschool and put him into daycare. So right. that's why it was a good fit for us. Right. So does your nanny pick up your older child from preschool? Yeah, She does pick up some drop offs. And then how long does she stay during the day? So we just literally this week or last week changed. And so now we have 25 hours. She's going to be here eight to one. We before just had someone three days a week, but now we have someone fewer hours, but like five hours a day for every day of the week. So she does pick up. Basically, my son doesn't get to be with her very much. Basically drops off, comes back, does a little bit of cleaning, hangs out with my daughter, um, picks up lunchtime, and then I'm here. (laughs) Yep. But that's it's so much work, right? I think (laughs) the thing that's really, really interesting to me is I'm constantly like diminishing the work when it's my contribution, but like recognizing it when it's someone else. So I'm like, oh, let me just like quickly do the dishes for you before you get here. Oh, lunchtime, it's not that hard. Or like, I'll do all this. And then it's a tremendous amount of work. And when we say it out loud and say, oh, there's somebody else doing all these things, drop off and pick up and lunchtime and this, you're like, oh, that's a lot of work. But for some reason, we expect ourselves to do it for free. (laughs) Well, not for free, but like without complaint or without difficulty. And even when my when I used to do the three days, my husband did the three days, he never asked for this, but I would find myself like preparing for his days, right? Like, is the preschool bag ready? Is like trying to make it as easy as possible <laughs> on him. So I don't know what that is, but I just think naturally it's like. <laughs> Sorry, me too. <laughs> I do that too. When, so my husband works a really early job. He switched his schedule around when we had kids. So he used to work 10 to 6. Now he works 8 to 4, which is great. And he leaves the house early four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. But he works from home on Wednesday. And on Wednesday, it's my day. So I get to go to the gym and then I come home. And usually he goes to the gym and then he showers and he goes to work and he does all that. So this is my day, except I come home to shower. And when I come home after the gym, I like immediately start diving into cooking breakfasts for people and packing lunches. And Alex has to push me out of the kitchen. He's like, you are not allowed to do this. And I'm like, I'm sorry, force of habit, force of habit. (laughs) Yes, yeah, totally. Okay, so deciding was kind of the big area number one. Let's talk about searching. Because once you've decided and you're like, now I need to search for a nanny, how do you do that? Where would you start? So I think the question is, where do you want to look, right? And I've done, as I was thinking about this podcast, our first time we tried to use our personal network just because I was scared to hire a stranger. Um, Our second time we learned that we were competent humans and good at vetting people and we could trust ourselves. And so we used care.com. That worked beautifully. And then the third time we actually attend two churches, but the bigger church we attend, their child care, their nursery, they pay for their people. And so like as employees, so they're fingerproof, fingerprinted and everything. And so we actually tapped into that network and they got emailed. And so we got our candidates through our church the last time. Oh, that's so cool. Okay. So there's the local network, which is something I used as well. We have local listservs and mommy groups and bulletin boards and then care.com. We also used that. What did you think of each? Yeah. Okay. Talk about care.com because that's national and lots of people can use it. So the personal network worked pretty good, but we it was hard to find enough candidates who were available for what exactly what we were looking for, the schedule. For care.com, um, we it, there's a lot more people to sort through, but we did this thing where we would grant people FaceTime interviews where we just chat with them on the phone for 15 minutes before we like, because as you know, like even just meeting in person is a cluster. So mm-hmm. we would do that. Cluster mass is what I've been calling it. (laughs) Yes. We would do some 15-minute interviews via FaceTime before we would do like an in-person interview. So you texted me this because you went through the nanny hiring and um, you posted about it in our mom's group because we're in an online mom's group together. And one of the things that was so helpful was how detailed you were about the workflow. And it was so useful. So first you cast your net 
out there. And you might cast your net in your, I'm part of a, a Yahoo group. And so I wrote a posting and I said, hey, um, neighborhood parents, I'm looking for a nanny. I'm looking for nine to one or nine to three. It's going to be during the work week. It's about 20 hours a week. I'm wondering if anyone wants to do a nanny share. Some light housework is included. I have a toddler and I have a newborn. So that was kind of the scope of what I wrote. And then I went to care.com and they were really great because they had even more specificity about what you want and don't want. So if you are struggling to come up with a job description, go to care.com and try posting one because they'll ask you things like, does it need to be a smoker or a non-smoker? Do they need to have a car or a vehicle? Do they need to have a driver's license? Do they have to be have legal immigration status, things like that, that you might not even know to think about, which is really useful. I would say on care.com too, you can also, potential nannies also post their profiles. So our second nanny, we actually found, I found her. So I searched oh. profiles and I reached out to her. That's awesome. Yeah. What did you find attractive about like candidates? What were you looking for? Do you remember? Oh man, did I even know? So the cool thing about care.com is they post their like basically resumes. So you can read through the experience that they've had. So I think it was just a combination of the experience they've had. And um, like they write like li- a little bio, like they write a few paragraphs. And so kind of just like the vibe of what they're writing, why for me, and we'll get into this in the interview questions too. It's really important for me to know why they're looking for a job. Like what's the motivator behind being with children and obviously getting paid for it. But so I think I was kind of even checking for that vibe as I was reading the bios. Oh, that's so smart. I remember reading somebody's application and she was older in her 60s or 70s. And she said, I've been a NICU nurse for like 40 years. And I don't I can't do the 14 hour days anymore. I but I don't want to retire. And I want to be around babies. And I was like, mm-hmm. I love you. Like, can I, I love hire that? You? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I agree that finding somebody's why is is helpful. And if you're listening, and you are you feel like you don't know, go and start reading the profiles like Anna's saying, because you can start to see, oh, what is it that I want? And what is it that I'm attracted to or like compelled towards? Like, what is it? And this whole thing is a great exercise in learning what you want. I'm realizing right now as we're kind of unpacking this. I think too, when I, I think when I first did care.com, I didn't even post my own profile because I think I was still nervous about, sounds crazy, but like hiring strangers, <laughs> like with, for my children, because I'd never done that before, right? I'd never had anyone watch my children that I didn't personally know. So I gave me the ability to look at candidates and have a little bit more control over the process without feeling like I had people coming at me that I didn't know. Right. So in terms of the workflow that you you told me earlier or that I mentioned earlier, it's like review the candidates, either post a job or start looking through the candidates. And then the thing I think that can be the biggest trap is how much time you can give oh away if you, if you start to like say, oh, I'm going to schedule everyone for an in-person interview. Don't do that. No, <laughs> don't do that. Do not do that. No. <laughs> and I recommended, which was so helpful, was do 15 minute phone calls or FaceTime interviews and just get a feel for the person on video because you'll know right away and it'll save you so much time instead of trying to organize time for them to come to your house and all of that. Totally. And I feel like, obviously, this isn't legal advice, but I feel like even at the FaceTime interview, I tried to do a good hiring practice and I would try to ask all the women the same questions because, I mean, just to kind of be fair, right? Like being able to ask them all the same type of thing in the FaceTime interview and then the in-person interview. Tell me more about what that is and what that means, because I think that's important. So like in my corporate job, it was really important that to be fair to all the candidates, right? You're asking all of the same hiring questions. And so how you basically do this is the first time you interview someone, you just write down what you ask. That way for the subsequent candidate, you can ask the same thing. But more than anything, the FaceTime or phone call is just to, I mean, you're trusting your intuition. And for me, what I told my husband, the point is just to get them talking because what needs to come out is going to come out for better or for worse. If we talk as little as possible and we just get them talking. Yes. Oh, this is, I should go back to the beginning of this episode and tell everyone that this also applies, like this episode applies to hiring in general, because what we're talking about is hiring someone Yes, and hiring best practices. So then you brought them in for an in-person interview and how did you end up deciding and did the first person you decide on accept your offer? What did that look like? 
So we did our, so we do phone call and then we did an in-person interview away from the house. And we actually brought our kids along to that just because we wanted the kids to be around. I think the first time we just did two of those. The second round, this most recent time we did three in-person interviews. So not very many in-person ones. The first time it was fairly easy because we had one candidate that was like a standout candidate. She said, yes, we did like a three day trial paid trial where we said, okay, let's do this thing for three days. Let's have a meeting, see if it's working out for you, see if it's working out for us. And then the second round, it was harder between our top two candidates, but just like intuitively, I felt stronger about one candidate and she said, yes. Oh, that's so great. And then what do you, with the second candidate that you also like, are you staying in touch with them to use them for babysitter hours? What did, what did the decline but continuity there look like? Yeah. So I feel like we're on good texting terms. And I actually, my friend's looking for a babysitter. So I just referred her to her. I said, hey, can I give my your info to one of my girlfriends? So I feel like we're still on good terms. I don't really know her. Right. We don't know what they, they're they thinking and feeling, but we can hope for the best. That's really interesting. So just to recap for people listening, after you've made the decision and you know what you want, which can be hard, then you need to start the search. And you can use tools like care.com or local list, listservs or networks or mommy groups um, or like posting in your local coffee house or yoga studio or Anna mentioned her local church. And then the hiring process, you start vetting candidates and you can do a short, quick FaceTime interview, then meet them for an interview outside of the house. And then once you have your final candidate, have them come inside the house and maybe do a couple of test days. Yes. I actually also called references. I forgot to add that. Ooh, tell me about that. So I asked them for three references. And I, at first, I didn't do this. But after a while, I started asking for someone that's known them for at least a year. Because sometimes they would give us more people that just met, you know, they just knew recently. But that's it. And what did the conversation with the references look like? My husband called references the second round. I called them the first time we hired. Again, it kind of the same thing as that initial 15-minute interview. I didn't expect to get a ton of juicy stuff out of it because they're only going to give you a reference if it's good, hopefully. But my favorite reference question to ask, if you want to hear. So number one, just getting them talking. And then number two is, if I were to hire this person, what's something that would be helpful for me to know as I manage them? Because it's otherwise it's hard for references to say negative things, but they kind of sneak negative things into here because they'll say, well, I don't know. For some reason, that just brings out some juicy stuff. Yes, that does. I can imagine why. Because it's like, oh, you know what? So-and-so, she never remembered to do this thing at the end of the yes. day. So like so she's really sure. good with reminders. Yeah. Yes. Mm, that's really interesting. I really like that question. I almost think that it's a useful question for an interview too. Like, if I were to hire you, what's something important for me to know when I work with you is like, I would be forthcoming. I'm super type A and I take on way too much. And so I do let things slip through the cracks and I don't want to, but I haven't figured out, out a way not to do that yet. So if you can help me with that, it makes me even better. Interesting. Totally. My favorite question to ask, this one's a little more on like finger to the button. I don't know what the right phrase is, but I learned this from the book. It's called the A method of hiring. It's like who the A method of hiring. It's how to find A, pl a players for your team. I think it's the who method of hiring. I'll put the book in the show notes, everyone. But it talks about the subtleties of language and the questions we ask. And instead of saying, what would your boss say if I got on the phone? You know, what would your last boss say if I got on the phone and asked him for a reference? People will say the the like best version of themselves. Oh, my boss will say I'm a great. And they'll say they'd say this. And if you change that to when I call your boss and talk to him as a reference, people are more forthcoming. And I found that fascinating. But if you put it all into active language and specifics, it's really, which what we're trying to do is really find out about each other. And if we're a good fit, we're not trying to like, get you or like play some gotcha. It's just like, well, what will they say when I call them? So that's also a useful tip here. I love that. My favorite interview question too is actually along the same lines of that for the actual nanny is tell me your most positive experience watching children and your most negative experience because it's like not even saying have you had a negative experience. It's like I know you've had one. So you get to kind of hear how they frame their negative experiences too. Oh, that's really good. That's really good. So we bring someone into our house. We do a test day. The kind of biggest 
last section that I want to talk about with you, and I'm sure that more will come up, but the one that's in my mind right now is the onboarding process. Bringing someone on as an employee, because there's over the table and there's under the table. Under the table means you pay someone in cash and you're not documenting it, which is technically illegal if you spend more than $2,000 on anyone. So Anna and I actually have been texting and conversing back and forth about like, okay, how do we set up an employee and what does that look like? And and what system are you using? And we both had the same kind of journey of, holy shit, this is really hard. Oh, this isn't that bad. Oh, I figured it out. Wow, I wish it were so much simpler. I wish someone would just tell me how to do it. So that's kind of the point of this podcast. <laughs> yeah. And so the, like, I totally agree. The first time I did it, it seemed like a nightmare. The second time I was like, I didn't even plan ahead. I just kind of pulled up my Google Doc. It was like, not hard at all. Okay. So will you take us through this Google Doc for onboarding and all the things that you do step by step in all the glory details? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So first I arrange for a one hour meeting at our house before the like three day trial period starts where they're not in charge of watching the kids, though I do have the kids there. So that like, this is the first time that the nanny is actually in our home with us. And so it kind of lets the kids get used to her in our territory while she's not in charge of watching them. Smart. And So I basically break it into two parts, employment documents that we go through and then household documents and then kind of like communication at the end. Great. So first for employment documents, and this is like California specific, I I look over the employment agreement and you can get free templates of employment agreements online, but that's like the official, you're an employee, this is what you're agreeing to, this is why you'd be terminated, these are the holidays you'd get paid for. All those type of things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and then next, we talk through payroll and tax paperwork. I think you, are you doing your own payroll and tax stuff? We're doing, so we ended up using GTM. And you, I think you used nanny checks. So, so they're if you doing don't, it for us. Totally. And so I calculated it all. And we ended up paying about $65 a month to have nanny checks do our payroll and tax service. If you don't have a company doing it, then there's like a whole other slew of paperwork that you need to do, like firing filing your new hire report, and just getting all the payroll and tax stuff ready. Right. So I'll jump in here and say, like Anna just said, there's employment documentation, there's household documentation, and then there's communication style, which I think is so great as like three different buckets. The employment docs is kind of what we're going to drill down into now. When you hire a nanny as an employee, you are responsible for having an employee identification number, no, uh, tax identification number for your household. You have to file all the right paperwork with the federal government as well as the state government and maybe even your city, depending. And there's a lot that you have to do. You have to treat hiring a nanny like opening and starting a new business. The good news, however, is there's companies out there that do this for you. So I hired GTM and it's about $800 all in, I think for the year. It's about, it's like 60 or $70 a month plus a $100 filing fee. And you have to get your person to fill out the W-4 and the tax ID and all of that. But they take care of making sure that you have filed at the right time and you've done it all. Yes. Totally. What the things that Nanny Checks does for us, I just bullet pointed it. They do weekly payroll processing, including direct deposit, quarterly prep and filing, year end tax prep, new employer account, the EIN. I have an EIN for my business, but we have to have a separate EIN for household employees, yeah. right? Yes, too. So the new hire rep- report and then payroll and tax records is what they do for us. That's so great. So I'll put those links in the show notes, nannychecks.com, I believe, and gtm.com. They're both the same. Like if you're going to hire a PR company, these are tax, these are nanny tax companies that help you set up your household. And it's a service. And when you are budgeting for your childcare, remember that you'll be paying them an hourly wage, but then you'll be paying taxes on top of it. And you'll be paying for setting up all of the tax forms and systems. Yes. Which actually I will say was less than I thought it would be. So what intimidated me was like, okay, if we pay them, you know, X amount of dollars an hour, how much more is it going to cost us to pay for social security tax and all the other taxes? And it was less than I thought it would be. It's what I did is I took our yearly childcare budget and instead of dividing it by 12, I divided it by 13. Mm. Because that's about what it, I think the extra cost was about equal to a month. And I love that. what I did was it was 
the taxes, the payroll, the the hiring GTM as a service, and then also their year-end bonus, their sick days, and their vacation days. So that was just my rule of thumb for like, oh, how much should I budget for this? Just divide it by 13 so that you have enough saved for the taxes that you're liable for. I love that. Another helpful thing for me too was it was about 2 to $3 more per hour to have them on the books. But you're right, plus all those other things that you mentioned right. too. Right. It is a little bit more to have them on the books. And you and I are speaking from states that are probably the most complex because you're in California. Yes. I'm yes. in New York City. <laughs> so I've got New York City, New York State, and then and then everything else. And New York City, I don't know if people have been watching the headlines, but like the good news is that they keep passing all these laws where it's like people are available for paid parental leave, started rolling out in 2018, and workers' compensation, and all of these great benefits for workers. But as an employee, I'm responsible for paying those benefits. Yes. So as I'm, an employer. I, right, that's what I meant. Saying. Sorry. You're right. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. an employer. So it's a couple dollars more per paycheck. And then it's like an extra quarter to 50 cents more per paycheck for those additional local and state goods and services, which fundamentally, I totally believe should be there. But I do have to put it into my brain that things are more expensive than I thought as an employee. Yeah. Yes. So for California, and I think all states, you can purchase workers comp insurance. But I think for some states, it's required. Like for California, workers comp, which basically means that the employee gets injured while they're working. But here, I don't know if this is true for you. But I actually found out as I was researching it and calling all these insurance agencies, and no one was helpful, that our renter, we rent right now. And so our renter's insurance actually includes household workers' compensation. Oh, interesting. So you might already be covered. That's like, and she, yes. And like the first person didn't, like I was asking to purchase it and she was like, wait a second, let me look into something. Oh yes, it's on your policy. So I actually printed off that section and I printed the email where that agent told me it was included. Like I printed everything, but so we didn't have to purchase that in addition. That's wonderful. In New York, it is recommended, I think, if you hire somebody 20 or more hours and then required if it's 40 or more. And again, disclaimer, Anna and I are not legal counsel. We're just talking about our experience. And probably a lot of the things we are saying are slightly accurate to inaccurate. So go look it up, right? Like do your due diligence. Yes, do your own <laughs> Do your own researching, but hopefully this flow helps. Okay. So those are that's the employee side. Did you have more in that section of like hiring an employee? If you were to tell a friend you can do this, <laughs> like it's totally yes. possible. Tell me. The only last two things an employee in the employment section were having the sick leave rights poster posted on our fridge because legally as an employer, it basically lets your employee know how many sick hours they get per hours worked. And legally, you have to have that visible for your employees in California. Whoa. California and New York, they're like, they've got a lot of great laws and they've also got a lot of great laws, you know? <laughs> Okay. And then the other thing is just, I guess this is more of the household part, but like I collect co emergency information for our nanny and I didn't do this the first time, but I was like, I should probably like, if they don't show up, like I should check in and make sure they're okay. Or so I collect their contact, their emergency contact information too. Oh, that's so smart. I thought you were going to say um, emergency information for your household because we that have too. a bulletin up on, by the side of our fridge that's all of our emergency contact. But for the nanny, in case they don't show up, I am going to take a note and do yes. that myself. Well, and I didn't do this the first time, but I realized all my corporate employers had done this for me, like collected my emergency. Con so I was like, that's probably a good thing to do is to know if your employee no shows, like just checking in and making sure they're okay. Right. Our medical and family emergency, it's, it's a two pager and I have it laminated and it's up by the wall. I jokingly call it like in case of the zombie apocalypse documentation, because I have like 40 friends phone numbers and addresses written down. <laughs> because I'm like, if the phones aren't working, I need to, you know, like I need I'll have to carve through the snow and climb a mountain to get to a landline to call. And like I said, type A, everyone who's listening to this podcast knows this. So get the emergency information for your nanny. I love that. Okay. So that's it for employment. Employment. So the next step in terms of onboarding and bringing somebody on as a new hire and into your household, which is analogous but not the same as bringing them into your business, is your household documentation. How does your household work? What does it look like? How do you teach someone what they need to do? Yes. Do you? I'm happy to do it, but do you want to do this one and then I'll chime in? 
I'll tell a little story and then I want to hear all your things. Great. Tell me your story. I went to smile.amazon.com, which is a way that you can uh, make your Amazon actually purchases benefit charity, which is great. And I bought myself a pink shiny binder for $8.99. And then I got the laminated insert sheets because I was like, oh, this is like going back to school. And I made a nanny binder. Oh, and, that's amazing. <laughs> so it lives on top of our microwave. And in it, there it just says the Peck family household policies and guidelines. The first page says, welcome to our family, and has a couple of sections. If you can't tell by our bookshelves and our house, we love reading, learning, and adventures. And we believe that moving the body and exercising the mind are important skills to cultivate both as little ones and as adults. Thanks for joining us. And thanks in advance for helping us take such good care of our kids. Oh, I love love that. And I love that you have an official binder. (laughs) We do. It's pink. And then it goes about Alex and Sarah. And I tell them a little bit about who we are and what we do, our boys, our house, and then the schedule. So about Alex and Sarah, it's like, okay, I'll skip that. But about our boys, we have two sons that we're crazy about that keep us on our toys. Our house, we strive to keep a tidy, organized home because we think it's soothing for people within it. We have routines that we involve the boys in. Leo has chores and is learning how to get dressed completely on his own. So that's just like kind of a warm, like I want people to feel good coming into our home. It's not like, hey, you get to work, you know, (laughs) I would hate to work for that. So I think a lot about who am I as an employer and what is it like? Then I have a page on Leo with photographs and a page about Henry with sample schedules. Um, And this is like the nanny and the babysitter binder. So if we ever need somebody like a friend to come over and babysit at the last minute, they can just flip to the Leo page or the Henry page and see like, oh, here's his sample schedule and be able to jump right into our family and our routines. I love that so much. (laughs) Um, And then we get into like the nitty gritty, which is like policies and guidelines. And we have a communication policy, housework expectations, rules on photography, social media and screen time and events and outings. And that's like the the welcome to our home packet. Beautiful. I can just imagine the binder like sitting on your fridge right now. <laughs> I'll take a picture of it and I'll send it Please, to you. Please, will you? <laughs> yeah. And then we have the like CPR laminated guidelines up on the wall and we have our emergency contact um, up on the wall. And we did a whole contract with our nanny as well. But I feel like I'm getting into the weeds here. That's kind of the oh, big picture. Oh, it's great. <laughs> I lo- no, I think it's helpful for people to hear because I think for you, it's like, oh, this is just what we do. But I think when you don't do it, you're like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. I would love to have that. Yeah. The only other thing I'll add is that the first full week that we have the nanny right away, I, I took her through everything that I wanted done. The trash is every day, toy pickup every day, and dishes every day. And generally speaking, it's between 15 and 30 minutes of work. So it's not a tremendous amount. We live in an 800 square foot apartment. It's just there's not much space. Weekly, we picked a day to do laundry. So it actually happens to be Thursday. So today's laundry day. She does the laundry on her long day when she's here from nine to three. And then I said, occasionally, there'll be some errands or grocery pickup, but that'll be few and far between. So just setting the expectations right from the outset, this is what we're doing, here's a typical week, so that it's not like you come in and then I change things on you three weeks later or the expectations of the job change. I thought it was really important to start right away. Totally. I think it does make things happier for everyone. So what about you? I want to hear about your household management and how you set that up and what's in your Google Doc because I know you have one yeah. too. <laughs> so ours is called Friends and Family Child Care Guide. <laughs> and it's it. similar to yours I where it has it. some photos in the front. It's not in a beautiful binder though. I print it off. <laughs> it's but I, just put it like, I, I can like, send you the link. <laughs> please. I just put it in like a manila folder. So I have some photos and then I have a little introduction paragraph. And then yes, just diving into food prep, food like foods, like types of foods that kids like to eat, um, stuff about discipline, stuff about screen time, about first aid. I have, like you said, emergency contacts for semi non emergencies. Um, I'm pretty available while I'm working. Um, but I also have like some of my good girlfriends and relatives, phone numbers and stuff on there. We have a cash card for like really small expenses. So I talk about the cash card. We have, we talk about our daily schedule, same thing as you daily tasks. So our nanny helps with, um, three things, dishes, tidying, and laundry. And so I let them know like while our son is in preschool, 
like the, and I also prioritize it so that if they run out of time or I let her know, like, obviously the child comes first. So if things are crazy or if you just want to stop and play, like this is the order of my, like I first would prefer for things to be tidied and then if time allows dishes and then if t- when time allows laundry. That's so smart to have the the hierarchy and to know and to be clear, like what is it that would make me the most happy and what are, this is just good practice for partnerships and for any type of work relationship at all. It's like, hey, these are the 10 things I want to get done and this is the priority of importance is so useful to give to another human being. Totally. And then, yeah, I have the exact daily schedule, which is kind of the same every day, the preschool stuff. And then when I put my daughter down for a nap and when I feed her lunch and when I feed my son lunch. And yeah, similar to you, for the first, I kind of walk her through everything for the first time. And actually for the first preschool drop off, we went together to do that, introduced her to the teacher, make sure her name's on the emergency or the pickup list of approved people that can pick your child up. And so I think what I've done as I've gotten a tiny bit better at this is I've just given more time to the process instead of like feeling like, oh, I finally have childcare. Now I can, you know, do my thing. Just really giving onboarding a serious investment of time. Yes. Like it'll take the whole first week. Um, yes, mo- totally. Like at least half of the hours of the childcare that you have will be dedicated to today. I'm going to walk you through because I had to be there next to our nanny, who's amazing. She's um, worked at two daycares before. She's now working with three different families here in the neighborhood. She's been with families for a long time. She wants to start her own daycare. Like She's an amazing human. She's been with more babies than I've been around. But still, it takes a while to do the knowledge transfer of, hey, this particular baby is sleeping in really long stretches and eats more than other children that I've seen. This is very true, actually, of Henry. And so if he's crying a lot, here's what I've noticed about his signs and his cues. It's knowledge transfer. And it, you know, she was coming in and out of my office, which is in the home, and just knocked on the door and said, Hey, I'm trying this thing. And it's um, not working. Let me know. Because we're sharing information about what's working and what's not. And and now it's the second week, because we this is really fresh for us. And now it's like, I have five hours in a row to work, like I have to go out and pump. But yeah. that's about it. Totally. All right. So You have a couple of other, that's it for household. Okay. And then the last section is communication, which I know you have some pretty cool, you have something called the hotel concept. Yes. I actually got this from someone in our baby and our babies and our online group. (laughs) Babies and babies and babies, that group. (laughs) Totally. Babies and babies and so many babies. But this was just, I actually didn't use it this last time, but I used it the first time, which is just like kind of giving them some autonomy to let them know, hey, if there's anything you see that could make our household work even better, let me know. Like having them help co-create how to run your home. Oh, I love that. So this last bucket of communication, I think, and I love that you broke it into these buckets of employment, household and communication, because communication is so important. It's like, how do you talk to each other when things are going well? How do you communicate new tasks? How do you give constructive feedback both ways? What comes up for you under the communication bucket that that has really helped you? So three things. The last one I'll let you talk about. It's like the check-ins because that was from you. (laughs) But the first two are whiteboard updates. And so our first nanny actually started this. We have like a little whiteboard in like a central place by our kitchen. And she would just write down, especially because when she was working for us, our daughter was younger. She was one or a little bit under one. And so she would write down when she changed her diaper, what she ate or didn't eat. I didn't realize like after I was like, wow, this is so helpful for me to know. Cause I think as moms, we mentally note it, but it's just nice to be in communication around the baby's functional needs. Totally. It's when you're doing a transfer of any kind, like I find I need to know, Hey, when was the last time he's fed? Has his diaper been changed lately? Do you think he's hungry? When should he go back to sleep? All of that is, is useful information. I love the whiteboard. And then the other one is just, how do you, you hinted at this, but how do you prefer to be approached during con- for constructive feedback. And this does two things. Number one, it lets them know, hey, we're going to be honest here. And if there's something that needs to change, I'm going to tell you. So it kind of subconsciously sends that message. But also, I really do like to know, most people say, I just like to be told directly, or I like to be told in person, or, but just really listening for how they want constructive feedback. That's so smart. It's like anytime you pre-plan something, it takes the stress off of the first time you have to do it. And if you take the stress off the first time you have to do it, it gets easier to do, which means you're not building up this long backlog of, 
well, if you could just do this and this and this and this and this, which is never a yeah. good conversation. No. All right. And then the last thing is you should talk about this one, yeah. just like right. the weekly check-in. <laughs> That's right. Because I remember you posted you on our Facebook clever. group, Rosebud Thorn. I got it from someone else, but I use it in my masterminds. And the backstory for everyone listening is Anna was going through the hiring process and she posted in our online group, what's your best hiring practice? And so yeah, I was what, like, oh, here's, what am I doing? <laughs> here's one. This is one that I love. And I shared and we crowdsourced a whole bunch of stuff. And then she came back and she's like, hey, here's everything that was shared. And I was like, wow, this is awesome. And Anna was like, no, you shared that with me. <laughs> <laughs> which it's, I guess, like a another kind of takeaway for everyone is find a buddy to do this with. Yes. Like, yes. you don't have to invent everything yourself. Piggyback off of this episode. Find another friend. Write down the stuff that you are doing and then like document it so that you can give it, pass it along to the next person. And I don't want to leave that hanging thread, Rosebud Thorn. It's a communication tool where you – you can tell people what's going well, what's the rose, what's coming up that you're excited about, what's a bud, and what's a thorn, what's not going so well right now. And by having the format or the template, you're alleviating the pressure of having to always be positive or negative. You're just like, hey, here's the thing. What went really well this week? You know, Henry rolled over. He hasn't done that yet, by the way. You know, I'm really excited about spring coming. It's been such a pain to be getting in and out of these winter coats, but I can't wait until I can just put them into one layer of clothing. And then thorn, you know, it's actually, we always seem to be out of coffee and that's a pain or the laundry room art always seems to be full, whatever it is, right? And it just facilitates easier communication with whoever you are spending a tremendous amount of time with, an employee, a household member, all of the above. And I find, especially for our first nanny, like this just gave like a little pocket of time to have her be heard, right? Like she's working really hard. I really, I mean, I really value the work that our nannies do. And so I think it's just also giving that space to let them be heard and let them know, like, I really value what you do. Anna, this is so great. I knew when we started that we could go and and talk about so much. And I already know that we could do a whole nother hour on hiring best practices and and everything that goes into this. But I'm going to stop us now. I think that was it. Because like I, I can't think of anything else. <laughs> there's so much here. I hope that everybody listening, this was so useful and helpful. If you're doing the nanny search, good luck. Hats off to you. It can You've be really this. wonderful. You've got this. Yeah. What's? Can you close with telling us something that kind of surprised and delighted you about hiring a nanny or something that people can look forward to that you weren't expecting? I think like just like on the other end of it, it's like, it's just easy. Like I'm, it's it's a lot of work and, and intention, but on the other end of it, it's so rewarding. And it, at least for our family in the season, I feel like it's an amazing arrangement. I love when I go out into the living room and I see my nanny playing games that I don't know and yes. my kid looks so happy and I'm like, wow, if I had been trying to do that, you, I would be aggressively bouncing you in the rocker while on my laptop. Like yes. you're getting such a better deal, kid. <laughs> I love yesterday while I was on a call with a client, I heard my daughter who is just turned hers two, like counting with her nanny. And I, I was like, that's right. I need to start teaching her to count. But she was like, one, two, three. And she can hardly talk. Like yeah, she can yeah. be, So I was like, wow, she's learning to count. That's amazing. Oh my God. Leo, Leo, he could get to 20, but then he just starts making stuff up and he's like yeah. 20 peanut butter, 20 strawberry. <laughs> 20 apple and I'm like that I guess it sounds like we just tack things on to the end of numbers okay Anna yep. this has been great where can people find you, you and your work on the web tell them where to find you just on my site Anna Franzen or at heartcenteredcommunity.com mm, perfect thank you and you know I always say this and I mean it Leave us a review on iTunes if you like our show. It takes a few seconds and it really does help us a lot. If you want more of what we're talking about, go over to startuppregnant.com and get on our email list. We send out a weekly newsletter with time-saving tips for parents and entrepreneurs. And I always include a weekly gadget or tool or something awesome that we've stumbled upon to help make your life just a little bit easier. And as always, you can reach out to us at hello at startuppregnant.com. We love hearing from you.